Corinthians chapter 16, the first four verses of the chapter. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, Paul says, Whosoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. Here we are at the last chapter in our series on 1 Corinthians. We spend months now here in it, and I sure have enjoyed it. And we've come to the subject of giving, so we'll go ahead and kill the service right off the shot. I begin with the paragraph that I began with this morning. It, it says, uh, your fi financial giving can make you an overseas missionary without ever leaving your hometown. It can make you an evangelist without ever mounting a pulpit. It can make you a gospel broadcaster without ever entering a radio station. It can make you a Bible teacher without ever writing a book. How? By financially giving to God's work. So, we're dealing with the subject of giving. These particular verses deal with taking, receiving, collecting a love offering. That's what they talk about. The Corinthians are going to take a love offering for people who are serving God in another place. Jerusalem by name. 800 miles away and they're going to take an offering for Jerusalem Malachi 3 8 and many other passages talk about tithes and offerings this morning we focused on the tithing and established that uh, a definition for it first of all what is tithing it is Hebrew 7 2 the tenth part of all that's the phrase Hebrew 7 2 the tenth part is the Greek word decate and then three more times in that seventh chapter you'll find the word tithes Decate, same word, a tenth part. So we established the fact uh, this morning that tithing is uh, in the New Testament. Matthew 23, 1 Corinthians 9, Hebrews 7, all talk about tithing. We made the point that it's unreasonable to think that God would call preachers and people to start churches and would then call them to the Great Commission, going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's unreasonable to think that He would set no specific way to finance it. It just doesn't make sense that he would set up no particular method for financing. 
Yet, in modern day, there's, there are those who are trying to say, basically, just give whatever you feel is right for you to give. And that's the attitude. What if this year, people didn't feel like giving? You know what you have? <laughs> You'd have a Hebrew 13 situation. Where the priest and the Levites are out working secular job. And the house of God is forsaken and neglected. And God then rebukes them and said, Why is all this taking place? Because you've not brought the tithe. That 10% to the temple. To provide the needs of the house of God. So God established tithing. We saw it this morning. It was established before the law was given. Abraham, Jacob recorded are recorded of them. And then it was under the law as well. And it's also tithing is after the law. And so we define it by saying that tithing is giving one tenth of your income to God with the emphasis Old Testament and New Testament, we'll see it tonight, through the local church. which is the New Testament storehouse, just like the temple was the Old Testament storehouse. So let's focus in on it and see not tithing, but love offerings, because that's what this, these verses are about. They're about a poverty relief project, a poverty relief project over at a church that's 800 miles away. It's not regular offerings. It, this is special offerings. This is love offerings. It Book of Ezra would describe it as free will offerings. Numerous times in the book of Ezra, you'll find that term, free will offering, and people offering willingly free will offerings. So, uh, the Bible says that the tithe is the Lord's, and he uses such language that he is bold about it and stating that to fail to tithe is robbery. He said, Malachi 3, 8, the Lord said, you have robbed me. Yeah. Leviticus 27, the tithe is the Lord's. It's not even mine. That 10% of what I've got is not even mine. It's his. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him. So the tithe is the Lord's. But offerings now are voluntary. Giving for special needs, special offerings is voluntary. It is. Tithes, offerings. All right, so let's look at these love offering that's described here in these four verses. Are you ready? Yeah. I've got three or four. I'm glad at least three or four are with me. The purpose of the offering. We're first given the purpose of the offering. Verse number one. Now concerning the collection for the saints. And we're told in verse three that the saints are saints who are in Jerusalem. Romans 15, 26 tells us that the servants of God in Jerusalem had fallen on hard times and were becoming poverty stricken. It's a very large church, isn't it? Over there in Jerusalem, thousands and thousands of people have been saved and born into the family of God by the Spirit of God. We know about it. Simon, Peter, and uh, the day of Pentecost and af thereafter. And so there are all of these people and something's happened. The Jewish community, they're Jews, largely. The Jewish community in Jerusalem 
disowned many family members after they got saved. The Jewish community fired fellow Jews who professed Christ as their Savior and set about to do all they could do to persecute those people in that city at that time. So you can see why there would be a crunch financially for all of them. And so what we have here is the need for help. A love offering will be taken. We're told that it came from four churches in Galatia area, three in the Macedonia area, and then Achaia, Corinth. Eight churches are taking offerings. Eight churches. For Jerusalem, those thousands of people who are saved in Jerusalem. Uh, one of the things I thought about here was that there were eight churches that cooperated. You can cooperate with a common faith. Uh, those who are of common faith with common endeavors. Uh, and, and we ought to. We, if we can, there are uh, churches that you can help participate with. But having said that, uh, I'm not talking about an ecumenicalism that just says, okay, just everybody, it doesn't make any difference where you, what you believe or if you believe fundamentals or not or any of that kind of stuff. No, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like-minded sister churches can cooperate in endeavors. And um, I, I have no interest in supporting, and it would be unbiblical, to support something that is uh, doctrinal and heretical. You hear me? And God does call for the sister churches, though, to work together. Um, they're taking an offering for people who are serving God in another place. Those who are serving God faithfully in another place. Those who are in dire need. You say, well, how in the world does all this apply to us today? Well, it could apply to missions. Mission giving. You know? There are mission needs. And um, it's right to take special offerings for foreign missionaries, for home missionaries, those who are taking the gospel, faithfully taking the gospel, helping a sister church somewhere who is like-minded, helping them in the things of God financially. Maybe they're in, in a ditch in a bad way some, for some reason. So... The purpose for the offering, first of all. There's this great material need that Jerusalem Church has. Secondly, the procedure for the offering. I see a when, where, who, and what in these verses. When is this offering to be taken? Upon the first day, verse 2, the first day of the week. That's Sunday. Well, why collect an offering on Sunday? Because that was the day of worship for the New Testament church. Everybody will be there. Collect the offering then. It only makes sense. You know, the Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 1 verse 10, that Sunday, the first day of the week, is called the Lord's Day. It was to be a, a, a commemorative, it, it, it's not Saturday, Sabbath, that we're already told Colossians 2, that doesn't exist anymore for us at all for New Testament church. But the Lord's Day does. It's the day we meet together to celebrate the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ and worship Him. You know, I thought about the blue laws in our country. We have blue laws. Now, mind you, they didn't have them in Corinth. They didn't have them in Jerusalem. Okay? But the United States of America has something called blue laws, and they show respect for the Lord's day 
and for the church. Having said that, many of them nowadays are ignored. Even though they're still on the books. Um, what are they? Businesses. There was a time businesses in this country did not open on Sunday. There were blue laws. There was some measure of respect for God and the church. Business didn't open on Sunday. Illinois still has a law. They do. I mean, we have a law. Do you know that a car dealership can't be open on Sunday? Still. All roots back to the blue law. But then all of a sudden, businesses start, started opening up on Sundays. But there were certain businesses that still could not. Gambling businesses couldn't open. Horse racing. Those kind of things, they could not open. Uh, restaurants could not serve alcohol on Sunday even when they op started opening up. They couldn't serve on Sunday or religious holidays. No alcohol. Then they changed that to 2 o'clock. That, they, you know what? That's my next point. Yeah. It is. What they did was they decided that they would uh, change it so that uh, you could that for, no, no alcohol purchased then they said, okay, we'll give you some, but it's going to be a two, time, like 2 o'clock to 6 o'clock on Sunday. You remember it? I remember it. I'm old enough to remember it. You remember it? Lincoln, you remember? <laughs> and some of those, those are still binding laws. I know there are dry counties in certain places, all that kind of stuff. But I'm saying where, the, where there are most, uh, a lot of places, they still have some kind of restriction on Sunday about where, what you, uh, Texas, I know, still does. Ohio, that, varied places. So all, all, the point that I'm making is upon the first day of the week used to be honored in this country not demanded of scripture as far as, you know, uh, like a blue law somewhere that the government's just forcing you to do stuff. No, but there was such respect for God and the Bible and the church. So, the when. Secondly, I see the where. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. That first day of the week is at church. It's giving at church. That Greek word, lay by him in store, in store, is the word from which we get the English word, thesaurus. It is uh, uh, thesaurizo. A treasury, a thesaurus nowadays for us is a treasury of words, right? A thesaurus. But here, this word is the same word that was used among the Greeks when they translated Malachi 3.10. Bring ye all the tithe into the, what's the next word? Storehouse. And it's the same word that was used in 200 B.C. whenever they translated the Hebrew into Greek, which God never did. But it still tells you what the Greek thought. And the word that matched storehouse in Malachi. You hear me? Bring it to the storehouse. 
the Old Testament temple is to be brought to the storehouse, the temple. New Testament, the New Testament storehouse is the local church. Mm -hmm. So there's the where. The when, the where. Thirdly, the who. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. That means every one of them. All, everybody at Corinth. The members of Corinth Church are told, everybody get in this, this offering. And then the what? It says, as God hath prospered him. Now, let me say, the tithe is a fixed amount, which is a very fair amount. 10%. 10 percent. 10 cents on a dollar, right? A dollar out of 10. 10 out of 100. Very fair. So somebody says, well, uh, you know, they make a buy, they make a buku bunch of money. Well, they've got a tithe. And it's just a percentage. Whatever it is. Just like it's just a percentage for the widow who had a widow's mite. Technically. Somebody says, I don't have much. Well, how could, I, how could I give not only a tithe, but an offering? But tithe is a fixed amount. An offering is not a fixed amount. Here, here's what I believe. That a person ought to pray about it. Like if we were taking a special offering. Pray about it. And see if you can get a sense on what you ought to give. And then give that. And, and if somebody doesn't feel any big push impression to give to that particular offering, uh, still get involved in it. Just give a dollar. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> give a dollar. Anybody can give a dollar. In the U.S. anyway. You know? So, the what? Give an offering. The procedure. So that's all the procedure. The who, what, when, where, and all. Purpose. The procedure. Thirdly, the plural pronoun in the offering. Verse number three. We're just, we've just been for these just expositing, going right down through, haven't we, Ken? And that's all we're doing. And the next thing I note is a plural pronoun in the text. It said, verse 3, And when I, Paul, come, whomsoever ye, plural pronoun, whomsoever ye shall approve, by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality, that's the chorus word, your kindness, your uh, grace, your favor, it's the grace word, your gift, your gracious gift. I said, we'll bring it to Jerusalem. But the plural pronoun there is ye, and it tells us that the local church is to receive mission gifts, and not only that, but for this love offering, the local church is to approve the distribution of it. You shall approve. You write the letters and say, we're giving you this much money and here it is. I cannot overemphasize in this text how important the local church is. Given to the local church, distributed by the authority of the local church. The local church is God's vehicle of distribution. And then it goes on to say that there's to be approval of messengers by the local church. 
uh, verse 3 and verse 4. Uh, it says, look at verse 3. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. Them. There's a number of people sent. There, there's going to be a pretty good offering. Corinth is a wealthy city. And there's going to be a pretty good offering. And that offering is going to be bags of coins. That's the currency of that day. <laughs> you better have a few folks with you. On the trip, 800 miles away. Right? You, you better have, you know, Brother Steve and Kenny and Brother Tom and Brother Bruce. Some of these fellows who've been trained and will stop right there. Because there's all these bags of coins that have to be carried to Jerusalem. And somebody has to protect it. Them! And then, uh, I, I, I can't help but think that the church has picked somebody to be sent who is trustworthy, people who are trustworthy, who can be trusted. Of course, you have letters that say how much is coming to verify so somebody's not crooking. You hear me? I can say this. 37 years in this assembly here. And we have never had a problem with all the money that's passed through this assembly through the years. Speaks well of her. Speaks well of Kirk Gant through the years. People of integrity. Got to have it. Renee's the assistant. That's a little questionable, you know, but. <laughs> With Gary at the house. <laughs> Woo! So, those are the plural pronoun in the offering. The church authorizes. Give to the church. The church then authorizes its distribution. I'm a local church man. I, I, I love Griggsville. We sure appreciate Miss Shirley. We love her. But you know what? They can run things over there however they want to run things. And we'll run things over here the way we run, believe God wants us to run things. And you know what? That's fine. Right? Yeah. But we're a local assembly. And we're going to function as a local assembly. Ye plural pronouns you. Final point. Say Amen. Don't say amen. <laughs> the promise about the offering. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 9. Paul talks about this same offering in 2 Corinthians. Chapter 8 and chapter 9. And listen to what he says, chapter 9, verse 7 and 8. There's a promise given here about this offering. Verse 7. Every man, as he purposed in his heart, so let him give. This love offering. 
Not grudgingly or of necessity. Oh, yeah, they made me down there at the church. I hate it. They twisted my arm. Oh, no. That's not what it is. It shouldn't be like that at all. Our attitude of giving is important. It is. You say, well, I gave, but I didn't want to give. Then just go ahead and keep it. You should have just kept it. Because God doesn't like that. He said, um, every man according to his, his purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And that word cheerful giver carries the idea of laughing about it. <laughs> Great God, Jerusalem, those folks are getting some help. Right? He loves a cheerful giver. And then verse 8 says, and here's the promise. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, givers. That you always have all sufficiency in all things. <laughs> God's going to supply your need. He said, you're taking an offering and God is gives promise that he's going to supply your need. Let me give a couple other passages that would correlate with that. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord. He said, put me to the test. You can put me to the test on this. Saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Windows of heaven. God pouring a blessing through the window for you. Givers. Luke 6, 38 says this. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give in your, into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. God is going, you say, truthfully, you, you I was reading a passage in Proverbs that said that you have to be wise with your money. You're a steward. All 100% belongs to God. God said particularly 10% you need to obey me with and give. But even the 90% still belongs to God. But he does tell us in Proverbs that we need to be discerning and wise about what that 90% is to be spent on and saved or distributed and so on. Right? You don't just haphazardly Oh yeah, God's blessing me. I'm giving my whole paycheck this week. I know I won't be able to pay the bills for a month or two months, but we're just going to go ahead and give. No, 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 no. That's not what God said. But God did say that he blesses a giver. And he'll bless Philippians 4. We always quote that passage, My God shall supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He'll supply your needs. He didn't say all your wants. My God shall supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But listen to the context of the fourth chapter of Philippians, verse number, uh, look at verse 15. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. The, those at Philippi were the only ones that helped Paul on his mission trip. For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessities, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all in abound, I'm full, have received of Epaphroditus the things which you, you were sent from you, an odor of a sweet-smelling Savior. But God shall supply all of your needs. See, it's right in the context of love offering. 
isn't it? Um, Deuteronomy 8, 18. Proverbs, we could look at Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. I'm not going to look at it. You, go, you, you read Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. That's a great passage. Bring all the, I can't read it. The 8th chapter, verse number 18. But thou shalt, of Deuteronomy, shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it's he that giveth thee power, ability, to get wealth. And it's not talking about like the modern TV preacher's heresy, where they say, oh, well, yeah, you ought to be driving big, have plenty of nice, real big Lamborghinis, and you ought to have, you know, big millions, and you should be pressing toward a billion now, by now, you know, if you're older, you walk with God. It, that, that's heresy. I like for them to take that message to Haiti when they preach the gospel down there. It's not going to get the job done. That's not what God's saying. It's saying that God will give you ability to have what you need And to take care of what you have to take care of. Power to give wealth. You say, like what? Well, he gives me a mind to think. A measure of physical health. He gives me an open door to be able to make money. All of those things. And more. And he said, we ought to remember that all of that comes from the Lord. Let me conclude. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're still in that, this same thought only in the next letter to Corinth. It says, chapter 8, verse number 4 and 5. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. He's, this whole 8th and ninth chapter is still talking about this offering that we're looking at in the 16th chapter of 1 Corinthians. That's going to go to Jerusalem. And this they did, he said. Not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. First, give yourself to the Lord. Then, give your stewardship to the Lord. Your finances. Come to the place that you want Him to superintend what you're doing. With what you've got. My opening paragraph again. Your financial giving can make you an overseas missionary without ever leaving your hometown, can make you an evangelist without ever mounting a pulpit, can make you a gospel bro broadcaster without ever entering a radio station, can make you a Bible teacher without ever writing a book. How? By financially giving to God's work. Let's stand. Ask this assembly. I never preach on finances. I don't. But you know what? We've come to this part of the series. You have to deal with it. So you strive to be faithful to preach and teach what it teaches. And I've made that effort today. This assembly has survived this many years because of people who are faithful givers. Thank God for it.
You say you're a bun bunch of money mongers, beggars. Oh no, we don't. Have, we take offering on Sunday morning. We don't take Sunday night. We don't take Wednesday night. We don't take offerings those days. A lot of churches do. A lot of churches will take Sunday night for a special love offering or something. We take a special love offering for Dr. Bagwell when he came for revival. We, we took special love offering for the Hart family who were here that Wednesday night. They'll be back with us the 10th of December. We'll take a love offering for the Hart family when they come sing and preach that Sunday. You say, you make me feel bad. I don't have a heart. I'm, I'm just fixed income. I'm, I'm, maybe you're just barely scratching by. That's why God set up the tithe. It's fair. Somebody gives a whole lot less than somebody else who makes a bunch of money. And God might look at that according to percentages and say, they give more then the person's got a lot of money. Sure don't preach this to hurt people. I preach it as God's way. To help people. It's God's way. Somebody said, well, you know, my, my husband's the breadwinner in the home and, and I, I'm, I don't work. I go to church, but I don't work. Listen, you can't, you can't force a tithe and giving because you're not the breadwinner. Let's say, let's say they don't want to give. Some people just get under the load and the guilt and shame about it when they can't do anything about that. And God knows about that. And, and ultimately, the man will give response, uh, accountability to God about it. That one who's the breadwinner. Father, thank you for this portion of Scripture. We pray that you'd help us to know the ways of God, that we might walk in them and experience the promises of God. Lord, how that you have come through when there was no way to come through. You've worked things out when we tried to figure it and couldn't work, figure it out. We thank you that you've established these particular methods for the advancement of your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.